Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Alia Shawab, uh, clinical um, nutritionist and committee chairperson, uh, scientific committee chairperson. I would like to welcome you all to tonight's third Emirates Clinical Nutrition Society webinar. And um, I hope you have a great time with us tonight. Um, uh, I will just talk to you about briefly about the Emirates Clinical Nutrition Society. Uh, it is a nonprofit medical society which has been established in 2016 by the efforts of a group of clinical nutritionists concerned in the management and amelioration of nutrition and diet of communities in the United Arab Emirates. The society serves to conduct continuing professional development activities that enables nutritionists to update their knowledge and provide a common platform to network. Um, it aims to reform the lifestyle of communities in the United Arab Emirates to order, in order to increase productivity and encourage communities to actively promote healthy living. Um, members of the Emirates Clinical Nutrition Society will benefit information on medical meetings, conferences that are being held locally and abroad as well, details of continuing medical education programs and other announcements. Um, they will also benefit uh, from receiving the quarterly Emirates Medical Journal, which features research papers and case reports written by local and foreign doctors, and reduce rates and participations in all EMA uh, activities and organize workshops, seminars, and conferences. Uh, so if you're interested to become a member, if you're not a member, you can log on to the Emirates Medical Association website that you see on the screen or send an email to the uh, membership at ema.ae, directly call on the number you can see, and you can find us also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, moving forward, a few housekeeping rules uh, that I'll talk to you about shortly. Um, this webinar is being live, live, the streamed on the MCI YouTube channel. Um, and it will be on demand available on the APCCN website and the MCI YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, you can type them in the question and answer box and mention the speaker's name in the, question, in the panel below. Uh, this webinar is CME accredited by DHA and you will be receiving your CMEs around 10 days from today. And if you have any questions or any um, support throughout the webinar, you can WhatsApp the number that you see on the screen. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Ms. Afra bin Ketta, who is the president of the Emirates Clinical Nutrition Society, specialist clinical dietitian and head of the nutrition department in Dubai Hospital, who will be talking about adiponectin. Welcome, Afra, and the floor is all yours. Yes, Afra, if you can just unmute your mic, please. Thank you. Can you share your screen, Ms. Afra, please? I'm going to try now to, I'm going to try to share the screen. Hold on. Give just a moment. Okay, so I think there might be a problem with your screen sharing, Ms. Afra. Uh,
Okay, your screen is shared, Ms. Afra. You're good to start. Yeah. Just, uh, just put it on full screen, please. Okay. So... Now it's clear? Yes, yes, you can start. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good word for everyone. And it's a pleasure to back into the important scientific topic today. And welcome for all attendees. Today, I'm going to talk about the obesity fact associated with the level of adipoctin exists in the body and the consequence of that. First, let us to take about uh, the overall of the obesity fact. Obesity, uh, obesity factors. The body can store extra energy as the fat in adipose tissue. It's mainly located beneath the skin. That's mean under the skin, which called the subcutaneous fat, and around of the internal, internal uh, organs, which called uh, vascular uh, fat. Development of subcutaneous fat in active process in infancy, adolescence, and pregnancy. In middle age and elderly people, overnutrition does not lead to effect storage. Uh, of energy as subcutaneous fat instead vascular fat accumulation become more common. Obesity is not just cosmetic consideration, it is chronic medical diseases that can lead to diabetes mellitus, high blood pressure, gallstones, cardiovascular, other chronic illness, as well as risk uh, factors for the number of cancers. Obesity is difficult to treat and has a high relapse rate. Most people who lose weight regain the weight within five years, even though medication and the diet can help. The treatment of the obesity cannot be short-term fixed, but has to be long life. Commitment to proper diet, increased physical activity and regular exercise. The goal of a treatment should to be uh, achieved and maintain the healthier weight, not necessary in the ideal weight. Even modest weight loss of five to 10 of initial weight and long term maintenance of that weight loss can bring significant health benefits by the lowering blood pressure as the studies show and lowering the risks of diabetes mills and heart diseases. The chances of long-term successful weight loss are enhanced if the doctor working with the team professionals, including dietitians, psychologists, exercise professional. As we, as you are uh, previously aware, the overweight and obesity are increased problems that lead to significant health and social difficulties for the people. And it is well documented that the, the obesity is associated with the increased risk of cardiovascular and higher overall mortality. Obesity also correlates with increased risk of Alzheimer diseases and other types of cancers. So commonly that the obesity defined as abnormal of excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to health. Measured by the body mass index is the simple index of the weight for height that is commonly used to classify the weight levels. It should be clear for us the lifestyle factors such as the overeating and physical inactivity and using or following any kind of weight management intervention, it will be increased the risk of vascular obesity. So overall, the studies appear that losing weight through the diet, exercise, medication, uh, surgery will increase the adipoctin level in the blood. 
So what is the adipoctin and what is the benefit of the adipoctin? Let us to start with adipose tissue. The body can store extra energy as the fat in adipose tissue. The adipose tissue is the loose connective tissue that is mainly composed of the cells uh, called adipocytes. It is mainly located beneath, that we mean under skin, uh, which called subcutaneous and around of the internal, as uh, said, around the internal uh, organs, which called vascular fat. Adipose tissue appear to be an important endocrine organ. It produces hormones such as adipoctin, lipitin, estrogen, as well as cytokines that play the important role for, uh, for cell signaling. Let us talk about the adipoctin hormone, brief about the uh, adipoctin hormone. In 1990, scientists found the protein secreted by adipocytes. The studies showed that the low level of adipoctin are associated with the raised levels of several different markers of the inflammation. And hormone of cytokinase, or the other, uh, we can call adipokinase, the other name, it is negatively affect health. For example, many adipokinase are pro-inflammatory and may support chronic low-grade uh, inflammation in the body. On the other hand, the adipoctin is protective and appear to reduce inflammation. The studies show the plasma concentration of adipoctin is much lower in the obesity subjects than in non-obesity health volunteers. Plasma level of the adipoctin are especially low in the individuals with the vascular obesity. It is uh, believed uh, that adipoctin deficiency may, be, uh, may play an important role for many of the negative metabolic consequences of uh, vascular uh, fat accumulation. The vascular fat accumulation is associated with insulin resistance, high blood pressure, high level of triglyceride, low level of high density lipoprotein, small, this low, uh, low lipid, uh, this lipoprotein particles and increased risk of diabetes and cardiovascular. A subcutaneous fat appear much more incident than vascular fat. Recently, studies suggest that the abdominal subcutaneous fat is not associated with the, with the risk factors for the cardio uh, diseases. Clinical use of adipoctin measurement. Adipoctin circulates in relatively high concentration in the blood and is easily measured. However, that use the adipoctin measures have so far been confined to clinical trial and has not yet separated into the clinical practice. Adipoctin concentration might also be used to decide on the aggressiveness of interventions and monitor treatment. For example, uh, it, uh, it has been suggested that the adipoctin levels may be used to monitor the efficiencies of intervention in patients with metabolic syndrome. And other studies suggest that the adipoctin levels may be used to monitor the anti-inflammatory effectives of the statin therapy. Statin is kind of uh, inhibitor treatment. As well as a change in adipoctin levels may also reflect on metabolic effect of diabetes therapies. And this is the references uh, value of the adipoctin uh, by Mayo Clinic. Now we will show you different studies uh, and reflect uh, the, the benefit of adipoctin, the level of adipoctin on the uh, health condition. Adipoctin and insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. 
Several studies have shown that the low product of adipoctin correlate with the development of insulin resistant and type 2 diabetes. Adipoctin ad uh, appear to promote the insulin sensing effect and increasing the availability of adipoctin might reverse insulin resistance and therapy decrease the risk of diabetes. The other studies of li uh, lipid abnormality. A high level of triglyceride and low level of high density li uh, lipoprotein cholesterol are commonly found in the people with the obesity or metabolic syndrome. So the high triglyceride to high density lipoprotein ratio is associated with the increased risk of cardiovascular. Adipoctin levels correlated positively with high density lipoprotein cholesterol and negatively with uh, triglyceride. Experimental studies have suggested that the adipoctin promotes synthesis of high density lipoprotein. Adipoctin and non alcoholic fatty liver diseases. Non alcoholic fatty liver diseases is common. Uh, among the people with the obesity. It may increase the risk of liver cirrhosis and cancer and other uh, of the livers. And non-alcoholic fatty liver have been associated with a low level of adipoctin in clinical studies. Low adipoctin levels correlate with the uh, severity of the fat accumulation in the liver. There is study also with the cancer. Obesity is associated with the increased risk of cancer. Uh, this is a relationship have been highlighted by the U.S. National Cancer Institution or Institute. A study suggests that adipoctin may be a rule uh, in uh, cancer. Low plasma level of adipoctin have been linked to some types of breast cancer, uh, endometrial uh, cancer or prostate cancer and colorectal cancer. Uh, it is not known whether adipoctin deficiency plays a positive role when it comes to cancer risk. Also the studies with coronary artery diseases as well also the several studies suggest that the reduced level of adipoctin are associated with the higher prevalence of coronary artery diseases and high risk of heart attack, as well as low level of adipoctin may be predictive of future coronary events. And this is the important part of us, uh, dietary and physical, uh, physical factors causing the raise of adipoctin. So it is very important. As what? A fish oil with sunflower oil will conjected a linolenic with a grape seed extract, green tea extract, a taurine, a kind of amino acid, and re sevretrol, uh, it is a phenolic compound, are able to ev uh, elevate plasma level of adipoctin. Losing weight, caloric restriction, and physical exercise can raise also the adipoctin levels as per uh, studies. And I have one uh, comment regarding recently, the phenolic compound such as raspberry uh, ketones have been marked for the weight loss one of their purpose mechanism of action is to raise uh, adipoctin levels. However, there is no clinical evidence for such an effect in humans. Thank you for all your listening. Thank you.
Thank you, Mrs. Afra. I think you're going through your poll questions. Can you see that on the screen? This is the second question for Mrs. Afra's poll questions regarding her presentation. And I think there is one more question as well. Yes, this is the last question of Mrs. Afra's poll questions. <laughs> okay, are there any more questions? Safra? I think um, that's it then with the questions. Thank you very much, Mrs. Afra. Okay, um, moving on. Can we share? Yes, okay. So moving on, our next speaker is um, Natasha Ajaka, senior, senior clinical dietitian, Children's Hospital. Her major field of interest are pediatrics, oncology and nutrition, low microbial diet application, follow in bone marrow transplant patients, nutrition related complications and deficiencies in beta thalassemia major patients, nutritional management of type 1 and type 2 diabetes and medical nutrition therapy and mental health eating disorders. Uh, welcome, Ms. Natasha. Thank you for joining us tonight. And um, you can start with your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm just sharing my screen and I'll be on. Might show, all right. Um, can you guys see me? Because I can't see the camera itself. It's, it's still not uh, shared. Your screen hasn't been shared yet. All right. So, unless something has gone wrong. Okay. Yes, I think it's starting. Yes. We're fine. All right. Yeah, I'll start the slideshow. Uh, I will be speaking about obesity in pediatrics. Um, we'll start with some of the prevalences and the definitions. True, obesity is a non-communicable disease, but it is contagious in a way. We do get influenced not only by what we see on the mass media, be it advertising campaigns, slogans, and many more, but also uh, our surroundings. Childhood obesity is one of the most serious public health challenges of the century, and the prevalence has increased at an alarming rate globally. The number of overweight um, um, at the age of five is estimated to be over 41 million. Uh, we have several definitions. I picked the WHO ones and the CDC. Overweight and obesity are defined as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a, a risk to health. A BMI over 25 body mass index over 25 is considered overweight and over 30 is obese. The issue has grown to epidemic proportions with over 4 million people dying each year as a result of being overweight or obese in 2017. So obesity is one side of the double burden of malnutrition 
and today more people are obese than underweight in every region ex except the sub-Saharan uh, Africa and Asia uh, before it used to be uh, the opposite. And um, I'll move on to the CDC definition, which is the BMI is a measure used to determine childhood overweight and obesity. Overweight is defined as a BMI at or above 85th percentile and below 85th percentile with children and teens at the same age and sex. Obesity is defined as BMI at or above the 95th percentile for children and teens at the same age and sex. So we can see these charts on 1975 and comparing it to 2016, over 10 times more children and adolescents were obese in 2016 compared to 1975. In the WHO European region, one in three, three uh, uh, of 11 years old is overweight or obese. Overweight and obesity, as well as their related diseases, are largely preventable. Prevention of childhood obesity, therefore, needs high priority. If and when noticed, the parents need to take action and need to take it at a serious level. Overweight and obese children are likely to stay obese in adulthood and likely to develop non-communicable illnesses like diabetes and cardiovascular diseases at a younger age. So the obesity might have a lot of consequences such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, liver disease, reproductive disorders, heart disease, mood disorders, and cancer disease. Eating healthy meat means eating a healthy diet. So in order for kids to be more active and more uh, interfering in their plan, my plate would be uh, one of the uh, best uh, solutions or tool to aid the, the kids to divide their plates into grains, fruits, vegetable, protein, and dairy. The, the grains that include cereal, bread, pasta, oatmeal, the fruit include any fruit while taking into consideration the portion size, vegetables, including any vegetable also, we might take the portion sizes into consideration, proteins, which are the meats, lean cuts definitely in case of obesity and the dairy that include all milk products and many made from milk. Start your child's day right. So plan for uh, ahead of time, if possible, before bedtime. Plan the night before and making a weekly schedule can help save time in the morning. Cut and sort the fruits and vegetables, pack the sandwiches, set the ingredients on the top counter in the morning. Include at least three food groups out of the ones that we uh, spoke about when evoking my plate. And the high fiber carbohydrates, fruits, vegetables, whole grain bread, whole grain serious eggs, low fat cheese. These can also also go in the in the lunch box at school. So here are some options for healthy breakfast: egg with bread and lettuce, peas with the slice of toast and fruits, and so on. It's colorful, and even these sheets, when uh, when uh, provided to the patients themselves as pediatric, it's colorful, it's fresh, and it's helpful. Now the main component is water. Sugary drinks like juice, soda, and sweetened colored drinks are very high in sugar and low in nutrients. These are also high in calories. Juices should not be given below six months water as well. Water and milk remain the best beverage choice for kids. Plain milk is preferred to flavored milk, definitely. And we can use low fat milk for kids in case of obesity. So the hint and tip, how repeatedly have you caught your stomach growl, feel a little uh, lightheaded or intense headache? You might be surprised to find that what we can feel hunger is actually thirst. These two sensations ride a fine line. Adequate and proper portion sizing. So also the mass media, the advertising campaign and the restaurants are making it very easy to upsize means um, uh, free potatoes, larger potatoes, a bigger amount, bigger size for the same price. So it's very affordable. Just to control portion size, do not buy big containers while going to grocery shopping. Control the amount of oil and fats added while cooking. Use smaller plates. Serve all meals using the plate method half plate fruit or one quarter plate lean protein. Try to eat together as a family. Do not let them be distracted by the, the computer or the iPad. Um, the selection at the supermarket should be smaller containers, especially for the junk that they would like to have every now and then. And of definitely for a healthier shopping, you should shop from a list. Don't go shopping when you're hungry. 
be active, involve them in physical activities. Yes, they might at the point change from an activity to another till they find their passion. But yes, we should be supportive about this. And even in daily activities, take stairs instead of elevator, go for a walk after dinner, play team sport with the family, organize neighborhood games. A lot of things can be make can make the kid active. So we have many types of uh, physical activity, but they should be active every day. So we, we cannot just tell them 30 minutes on daily basis. When they're kids, they can't do it, um, not on daily, uh, every alternative day. We can't tell them to do it on daily basis because they're kids and now is the right time to learn these uh, methods and techniques. Start slowly, do not push them. Uh, try to encourage them into finding the sport they like in order to do it, socialize with other kids to do it. Um, uh, they will progress slowly until they will do it all by themselves without even you prompting them. Sleep well. Of course, also uh, Afra spoke about the, the hormonal impact on, on weight gain and the hormones tend to uh, also relax while the body relaxes. So they give us a proper control of our body and metabolism. In addition to healthy diet and physical activity, adequate sleep is very important. And to each age, have an, each age has a number of hours that need to be. So four, to, uh, four months to 12 months needs 12 to 16 hours and ongoing so we need to focus on that as well not only the food nonetheless we do not only tackle the part that uh, talks about uh, what uh, us as clinicians do but also public health is is very important the implication of the multidisciplinary approaches made uh, and the awareness campaign that are various and made i i um, took the liberty to add some here because it really it changed uh, the communities that applied to it so uh, population-based approaches to childhood obesity preventions. Uh, this was published by the WHO Childhood Obesity uh, Prevention, and it's a population-based uh, approach. They worked on the process, the output, and the outcome. Uh, for, they focused on, market, on not marketing or uh, reducing the marketing of unhealthy food, uh, focusing more on nutrition labeling and not allowing food to be not labeled. Uh, food taxes were added on sodas. Uh, physical activity policies were made. Social marketing campaigns were made. For example, here you hear you have in Australia. I made a, a red slash where you can see the policy aims to increase the healthier options available in the government-run facilities. At least 80% of the two total food. Uh, and non-alcoholic beverages available in this facility. So they reduce the amount of junk available to 80%. Uh, we have on the side the physical activity in Brazil to program and adopt multi-sectorial approach, including partnerships with many other organizations. Large events were organized on weekly basis, on monthly basis with supervision, and they saw that the community became even more active. They encouraging physical activity in Bogota, also in Colombia, a number of other initiatives have been implemented. Also, the spaces, like here in Dubai, they made it very large and the amount of parks are numerous, so we can encourage and we can properly interfere on a community level. So the EPOD, the EPOD is, um, I'll just put the entire screen. So we have the EPOD target groups and children from zero to 12 years old and their family as well. Um, this is a... Um, uh, aims to reduce childhood obesity through a societal process in which local environments, childhood setting, and family norms become more supportive and facilitate the adoption of healthy lifestyle in children enjoying healthy eating, active play, and recreation. Um, uh, from um, oh, another point that is important in this, uh, everybody joined, like uh, not everybody, but a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, countries joined from France to Belgium to Spain to Greece to South Australia to Mexico and it all went together. There are also implications at school in the Caribbean. Uh, teachers were taught about nutritional importance and thus the teacher were teaching their kids at school to, to properly pick the food and to at least have an hour per week about nutritional education and intervention. So it's very, very important on that level. Also, a lot of studies were made, and this study designed and baseline characteristic of the short bout of exercise in preschoolers, so teach them young, preschoolers, like even under two years of age. 
So the results showed that if you teach them from this age, they will keep on going. And you can have the references here and at the last slide. A school-based physical activity program from promoting physical activity and fitness in children and adolescents aged 6, 6 to 19. Ongoing implementation of school-based physical activity intervention at this time, given the positive effect on behavioral and one physical health status measure. So it's a positive outcome anyway. We have a culturally tailored family center behavioral obesity intervention. So they worked on the entire family and they tailored a plan for an entire family to all follow the good advice, follow the healthy eating lifestyle with supervision from dietary dietitians and nutritionists. So the entire family followed up not only the individual that felt excluded because like his siblings are eating more junk as him. So he felt bad and so on. So it's a family approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Natasha, for that very informative uh, presentation. Uh, moving on, um, next speaker will be me, myself. Uh, uh, clinical dietitian, as I mentioned, bariatric care specialist from Imperial College London Diabetes Center. And I will be talking about healthy diets. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay, uh, I will be talking about healthy diets and what we know about it from a dietary perspective. Uh, I'll be taking you through the definition components, latest guidelines and quality determinants of healthy diet, the effect of dietary patterns of health on health and different dietary patterns that are being used by healthcare providers. Uh, to start with, there is a, uh, a common uh, mishap of the difference between healthy eating and a healthy diet, where healthy eating is merely the defined as the consuming adequate quantities from all food groups, which ensures that the body is nourished properly and capable, capable of performing its day-to-day -day functions. While healthy diet is a pillar of well-being throughout the lifespan, promoting overall health and achieving longevity. And like I said, people usually have uh, differentiate, cannot differentiate between these both terms. Uh, people usually consume habitual dietary patterns, not typical eating patterns. And this is usually reflected on their personal, social, cultural, and environmental influences. Uh, in particular, eating patterns or dietary patterns is consuming quantities or combinations of different food and beverages and diets and the frequency of which it is being consumed. Uh, this is usually based on multiple and interactions of different food components together, usually described in terms of energy and nutrients, low calorie, low fat diets, and usually as a cuisine, such as Mediterranean cuisine. A healthy full eating pattern in particular is based on dietary guidelines following different dietary guidelines to which it is being merely linked to good health and uh, better health outcomes when consumed regularly. And this is usually seen by achieving and maintaining healthy body weight, obtaining adequate nutrient intakes, reducing the risk of chronic diseases. Uh, this is usually also tailored by a uh, healthcare providers and dietitians to meet the individual's personal, cultural, traditional preferences, and as well as the patient's budget. Uh, as we can see, the components of healthy eating patterns, uh, as you all know, is based on the my plate, uh, where we, the individuals uh, consume adequate amounts of carbohydrates, proteins, fruits, vegetables, dairy products, uh, healthy fats, and uh, water intake. According to the WHO, the components of healthy eating patterns is limited uh, per day of the following, uh, total fat intake less than 30% of total energy intake, less than 10% of total energy intake of saturated fat, less than 1% trans fat intake, less than 10% of free added sugar intake, less than two grams or 2,300 milligrams of sodium intake, and if alcohol is consumed then in moderate uh, portions. 
And the healthy physical activity patterns is divided based on age groups, 6 to 17 years old, 60 minutes or more, three days per week, including aerobics, muscle strengthening activities, and bone strengthening. Um, for the age group of 18 to 64 years old is avoiding um, severe inactivity, inactivity and as well as uh, extreme uh, muscle strengthening activities and usually between 150 minutes per week of um, moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intense activities, two to three days per week maximum. 65 years of age and more to follow a regular adult pattern, but um, keeping away from vigorous activities just to stay safe in particular. The dietary guidelines for the Americans have been uh, developed ever since the 1980s with merely the same recommendations, more or less, focusing on um, weight, uh, adequate intake, and mainly the uh, focusing on disease prevention and not the treatment or not the treatment of specific diseases, but in general, preventing and promoting healthcare. Uh, and as we can see, as I mentioned, they focus merely on weight, sugar, and fat intake. With the latest guidelines is to achieve or maintain a healthy body weight regardless and limiting sugar and uh, fat intakes, uh, excessive added sugar and saturated fat intakes. According to the ADA dietary guidelines, the latest guidelines is again merely more or less the same, but also to focus uh, mainly on limiting calories from added sugars and saturated fats and reducing sodium intake to less than 10% of the dietary intake from the total energy intake. While the rest of the guidelines are merely the same, following a healthy eating pattern across the lifespan, focusing on variety, nutrient dense and amount, shifting to healthier food options and beverage options, such as how uh, Natasha has mentioned, supporting healthy eating patterns for all. As she also has mentioned, it's very important to focus on family support, the community support, and not just the individual, to achieve better health outcomes for the uh, community. How can we uh, determine uh, nutrition or nutrient intake in such uh, a population? Uh, usually, uh, quality determinants have been assessed using specific uh, indices. And this helps to understand the population's dietary pattern and the nutrition quality, which is why it is very important that we understand what type of nutrition quality is such a population following. Uh, this is usually done by assessing nutrient intake, comparing these characteristics to age and sex specific nutrient standards for nutrition adequacy. Uh, many patterns have been developed. Mostly, the most common ones are the healthy US style pattern, healthy Mediterranean style pattern, healthy vegetarian patterns, and all these follow the same guidelines, more or less. <clears throat> um, these uh, quality indices are validated, are validated diets, which have been developed, as I mentioned, to study diet quality and habits. The, med the Mediterranean diet score is a mostly well-known and widely known. However, it is not adhered by non-Mediterranean populations. We have the Healthy Diet Indicator, HDI, which is based on the adherence to WHO nutrition guidelines. This is worldwide used and comparing, helps compare different cultures or different dietary patterns of different cultures across the world. The Healthy Eating Index, or the HEI, it is developed by the United States Department of Agriculture, and this is also used to assess whether a set of food or dietary pattern aligns with the dietary guidelines for the Americans. So this is specific for a different strategy of guidelines. This is an example of the HEI, or the Healthy Eating Index, uh, the recent uh, scoring uh, score. Uh, as we see, it uh, helps uh, uh, compare 13 different groups or subgroups and um, across by using the sex and uh, age. And uh, with the maximum scoring of 100, the higher the score, the higher the adherence to the dietary guidelines. And the lower the score is the further that the population is meeting the uh, standard guidelines that are supposed to be followed. Okay, what are the effects of dietary patterns on the health of such a population? The dietary guidelines for Americans have developed a model or a tool to assess the different factors or 
patterns that are affected by following a diet and physical activity patterns on behavior. There are determinants that influence such a pattern and what are the results. For example, the influences uh, that determines include the system, depending on the culture, the household, social factors, individuals' behavior and biological factors, community environmental factors, and also some policies which are private and public sectors, depending also on the uh, type of the community. And this is also affects um, uh, as an outcome, the health promotion, uh, maintaining healthy weight, physical fitness, and uh, uh, healthy nutritional statuses, uh, prevention, and uh, uh, avoiding uh, chronic diseases, and overall uh, coming out with a better health outcome, depending on how this population is following. And um, as per research, following a healthy dietary patterns, as we have mentioned, is usually associated with favorable health environmental outcomes, helps reduce chronic disease risks, promoting healthy weight statuses, and fostering good health across the lifespan. It also protects against malnutrition and non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, health diseases, strokes, and cancer. And when it is started earlier in life, such as in the case of breastfed infants, it helps improve cognitive development, promotes longer-term health benefits, reducing the risk of obesity, and preventing the development of NCDs later in life. Um, this is a summary of the different uh, outcomes of not following a healthy uh, diet and the effects on different body organs. And this is a detailed description. And as we can see, the health outcome on cardiovascular diseases, body weight, type 2 diabetes, cancer, congenital anomalies, neurological and psychological illnesses, and both bone health are all directly and indirectly affected by following a healthy diet. And this is why um, uh, so many uh, governments are trying to uh, promote healthy diets in their um, school systems and uh, from earlier in age to, to prevent further development such uh, conditions later in life. Okay, moving on, we'll be talking about different dietary patterns that are being used in the medical field. Um, there are a lot of dietary patterns that are being used. I will just summarize the main important types of diets. Um, low carbohydrate diet, uh, it is based on using uh, the strategy of 20 to 50 grams of carbohydrates per day or 10 to 30 percentage daily uh, energy intake, uh, energy intake, no restriction on fat, saturated fat, and protein intake, more or less. Examples of such uh, diet would be, um, there are many examples, most commonly are the Atkins, South Beach, and carbohydrate addict diets. Uh, it is very significant uh, showing very significant weight loss on the, on the short term only. Less than six months, more or less, 13 percentage of total body weight is being lost. However, if it it's, um, continues for more than one year, not much weight is being shown. Approximately four percentage total body weight is being lost. Uh, concerns or side effects of following such types of diets, uh, less than two weeks, you can notice the patients have a uh, feeling of uh, tiredness, fatigue, lethargy. And if it continues for more than two weeks, some of the patients would come back with constipation and muscle cramps. That's why uh, multivitamins are required. Um, we, can, we have seen some of the patients uh, not being able to adhere to such types of diet because of its uh, restrictions. And um, low glycemic index uh, is the combination of low fat and low carbohydrate intake. Uh, it is adequate for uh, insulin, uh, to prevent insulin and blood glucose spikes. Uh, intake includes low or than 55 glycemic index uh, food uh, intakes. And however, there is no much uh, studies to show the um, benefits in weight management, whether weight loss or weight maintenance uh, as well. It is uh, shown, however, as per research, it is very beneficial for diabetic patients for maintaining uh, diabetes. Uh, low calorie or low energy diet, where the calories are restricted to 500 to 1000 calories per day, uh, 50 to 55 percentage of carbohydrates, 10 to 15 percent protein, 20 to 35 percent fats. Uh, such diets require meal replacement diets so that they, these patients have the exact dietary uh, intake that is uh, calculated as per the intake percentages. 
Uh, it has shown to decrease total cholesterol, triglycerides, low density lipoprotein, and in regards to weight loss, in the first six months, eight percentage total weight, total body weight loss. More than one year, approximately four percent total body weight. Again, more improvement in the short term. Side effects uh, on the long term: hunger, fatigue, headache, and constipation has been seen with some patients. <clears throat> Very low calorie or very low energy uh, dietary intake, limitations to 800 calories per day, uh, lower than the RMR, restricted, restricted to BMI more than 30, and such diets use meal replacement diets only. Examples include the Cambridge diet, which is widely being uh, used, and uh, OptiFast meal replacement diets, uh, which some facilities use, uh, especially for bariatric patients, uh, pre and post, depending when, when a significant uh, weight loss is required in a short period of time, because such diets have proved to show a uh, vast amount of weight loss in the short term. For example, four months, we can see some patients, uh, especially of more than BMI of 30, 30 percentage total, uh, 30 to 40 percentage total body weight loss seen. However, um, side effects would include hunger, fatigue, hypertension, hair loss, constipation, the risk of uh, formation of gall stones, and um, increased uric acid concentrations from the severe negative energy balance. Such diet is extremely difficult to adhere to and uh, restrictively requires medical supervisions and multivitamin supplementation uh, are uh, supposed to be taken. And such diets are not to be followed for a long period of time, 12 to 16 weeks maximum. And like I said, for a specific reason of uh, adherence to. Low fat diet, uh, it includes um, energy intake is being reduced to 20 to 35 percentage of calories from fat. Uh, this is widely recommended. A very common type of diet is the DASH diet, as I mentioned, recommended by the ADA, DGA, and AHD recommendations. Um, a lot of studies have shown uh, positive beneficial of following a low-fat diet, especially when it's combined with uh, uh, different uh, other uh, therapies to control uh, uh, hypertension uh, to hunt, uh, and um, caloric restrictions. And most body weight loss is being seen in the first 6 to 12 months. However, again, on the long term, not much weight loss has been seen more than six months following a such, such diet, unless and only it is uh, combined with uh, low caloric and restriction uh, diets. Very low fat diet, uh, 10 to 15 percentage of fat, 10 to 15 percentage of protein, 60 to 80 percentage of carbohydrate. This type of diet is usually uh, focusing on plant-based intakes, where limitations of dairy, eggs, lean meat, and fish is usually included in such diets. It is not a very, very common diet. Some of these diets include the Pritkin Prit diet and the Ornish diet. Um, it, shows the, it shows when following such a diet, reduced in weight and atherosclerosis, better weight pro, uh, loss outcome and glycemic control in the first four months, total body weight, weight loss of 10 percentage. However, more than one year, 6 to 12 percentage total body weight loss only. The main concern with following such type of diet is usually the deficiency of iron and vitamin B12. And again, this, uh, this type of diet is a very restrictive diet, therefore poor adherence and multivitamins, specific multivitamins uh, intake is required. Um, high protein diet, um, intake of 1.6 grams per kilogram per day uh, with a total of 25 percentage of energy. Uh, zone diet is an example, and sometimes we can uh, add to this type of uh, diet is the um, keto diet. Um, however, no major significance on body weight is being shown as per research and the competition. However, it reduces the risk of uh, CBA and metabolic syndrome. Uh, an important point is that if the type of protein that has been taken, not uh, lean protein, then the probability of developing high cholesterol, high saturated fat uh, would be uh, seen. Low fiber depend because of the low amount of fruits and vegetables and the focus on protein and feeling uh, full very fast. Uh, therefore, would uh, cause the deficiency in vitamins and minerals such as potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Uh, however, there is um, 
low research on um, hepatic function following such type of diet. And um, like I've mentioned, uh, following a high protein diet increases satiety. Therefore, um, lower caloric intakes from fats and reducing, if again, we were talking about uh, lean protein, then the reduction in triglycerides, LDL, total cholesterol. And it's beneficial on the long term for patients uh, with diabetes, CBA, and MS. Um, there's always a question with which diet should we follow? Is it a low carbohydrate diet or a low fat diet? Well, it really depends on the outcome. What are the outcomes that are required from following such diet? Do we, what markers are we looking for to, um, to improve? Uh, is he a diabetic patient? Is he a CVA patient? Uh, has this, this patient have a history of diabetes in the family or um, high cholesterol in the family? Um, this is how we can decide on which diet is uh, adequate for a patient. And not only just looking on uh, what is good for weight loss. So in the end, it really depends on what is the target issue that we're looking for. And that's how we can decide which type of diet should we look for. Not just merely does uh, going for a low fat diet reduce more weight than going for a low carbohydrate diet. Finally, in conclusion, I'd like to say that it is very important to uh, consume healthy eating or following healthy diet pattern, which is, uh, as we can say, vital and crucial for a person's developing a person's mental and physical well-being throughout the lifespan. Optimal nutrition can always be attained with many dietary patterns and not, not like we just mentioned a single type of dietary pattern. We should always see what type of diet and tailor it according to the patient or the individual's needs. And on the long-term maintenance, a dietary pattern is usually needed and crucial to follow to support optimal nutrition and health throughout the lifespan. And this is always um, based on the biological and medical needs, as well as the preference of the individual. Thank you very much. Okay, and um, I think this is the end of our uh, presentations. Um, before we move on to the question and answers, I would just like to remind you of um, the Emirates Clinical Nutrition Society if you'd like to be a member and join us. Uh, and as I said before, it is a nonprofit medical society established in 2016 by a group of clinical nutritionists concerned in the uh, ameliorations of nutrition and the diet and the well-being of the community of the United Arab Emirates. And it serves to conduct continuing professional development throughout uh, the platforms as I mentioned, and to reform lifestyle impunities in the United Arab Emirates to increase productivity and promote healthy living. If you'd like to be a member, there are many benefits that you can attain, information on medical meetings and conferences that are being held locally and abroad, details of CMEs and other announcements, uh, the quarterly Emirates Medical Journal, which features research papers and case reports written by local and um, reduced rates of participation and all EMA activities, workshops, seminars, and conferences that are being organized. Um, you can find uh, more details on the EMA website for the registration. You can contact us through the email seen on the screen or call on the following number. You can always find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Okay, uh, moving ahead. Now we can go through the questions and answers with our guests. If you have any questions, don't forget to type them in the question and answer uh, box in the panel below. And um, I'll be bringing them up and let's start with uh, our questions. Um, if our guests can please unmute so we can start with the question and answers. Okay, uh, starting with the first questions, I'd like to request Ms. Afra and Natasha, please to unmute. So we can start ahead with the question and answers, please. Thank you, Ms. Afra. Okay, uh, okay. I think uh, Natasha will not be joining us. Okay, so that's fine. 
Okay. Uh, to answer uh, some of them. Okay. Okay. So we, you've been going through a few of questions I've seen. We just go over the answered questions. You can read it. For, yes. Uh, Habibi, you can read it uh, for them. What yes. I'm okay. answering inside. Okay. Okay. How to do clinical management of pathological obesity? Okay, so weight management, uh, as per Afra's answer, weight management is a comprehensive approach including diet, exercises, physical activity, treatment through to boost metabolism, self-management to control depression, as well as bariatric surgery, which can help us uh, with the huge body weight. So it does not depend on one way to manage the weight only. Okay, next question is, do we give adiponectin shots as part of the treatment for obese people with comorbidities? Uh, use of adiponectin measurements, as I mentioned in the lecture, has far been confined to clinical trials and not yet spread into clinical practice. Okay. Um, next question was, are there several products of obesity treatment but don't seem to help? Is there a better brand? Okay, as she mentioned also, again, it is a comprehensive approach using diet, exercises, physical activity, and treatment throughout to boost metabolism as there is no a specific brand to help with weight loss. Okay. Uh, okay, one more question was asked, the disadvantages of keto diet. Okay, her answer was the ketogenic diet is designed for epilepsy condition. So we cannot market it for reduced anxiety like many centers are being doing that, unless the, there is a scientific evidence for that. Okay, so these are the answered questions. Moving on to the next questions. Okay, <clears throat> in pediatrics, uh, that was for Natasha, but I think we can answer it for that. Is there any further classifications as obese one, two, or morbid obesity? I don't think we, we uh, in pediatrics, we don't classify uh, pediatrics as the, as the same as uh, adults in, uh, in reference to the obesity. There is a chart, like we have, uh, we can see there is a chart that shows the uh, the range according to age and the weight or the uh, for, for, for the patients. So we don't classify adults the same way as uh, pediatrics. I answered that for you, Atra. Okay, next question. What is the minimum calories for children, especially in the growth stage? Would you like to answer that, Atra? Pediatric? Hi. What is the minimum <laughs> exactly? I'm not a specialist. Actually, I'm a specialist for the other. Not exactly. The okay. So, so let's see if we can answer that. What is the minimum calories for the children, especially if they are in growth stage? Again, we cannot decide depending on the age of the children because calories depend as the children grow. So there is no specific, and we cannot answer what is the minimum. If period. one of attendees, they are specialists with the pediatrician, they can answer. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Uh, next question. Can we have some tips about picky eaters? MashaAllah. Most of the questions are pediatrics. Tips about picky eaters. Um, for picky eaters with children, you can always um, try to uh, give, them, give them different options, uh, different uh, colors, try to make the children pick their own fruits, their own vegetables. Um, help, let them help you with the cooking or preparing the meals. Sometimes this encourages the children to uh, uh, stop or make better with the food instead of being picky about that. So that's the usual routine that we try with patients and the children. Okay, uh, is there a strong evidence that low caloric diet decreases metabolic rate? Not really, not really. There is no strong evidence, but it's like a trial and error. It really depends on the patient's condition and the patient's tolerance. Um, and again, the weight and uh, if the patient has any previous medical conditions. Uh, and that will affect that whether low caloric diet will affect or benefit the metabolic rate and all. Okay. Uh, okay, I think this is uh, for you, Ms. Afra. It's important to know that the causes of obesity, many things are missing. Causes of obesity. 
I don't think there is one specific cause. It is. I repeat the question for you. It's important to know that the causes of obesity are many. Many things are missing. So I think uh, Dr. Abdurazak he means that the different there are different causes of obesity, and none of them are known. If you can just mention a few causes of obesity. Can you hear me? So like we can say that um, not necessarily there is one cause. Many causes could be, uh, um, like we can say, maybe genetic, lifestyle, culture. So there are a lot of causes. There's no one point that we can pinpoint on. OK. Uh, for people who follow many diets and then suffering from obesity, it is very hard for them to lose weight again. What is the best dietary pattern for them? Okay, like we mentioned, uh, if the patient have followed several diets and obesity is recurrent and they're not able to lose weight, the best dietary pattern for them might not be one specific diet. Uh, so we can say we had a trial and error again, and then let's say if they have any metabolic diseases or metabolic uh, problems that could be the cause and not necessarily just one problem. And then we can see what diet could be followed. Like I said, it's a trial and error, not a specific diet could work for them, more or less. Okay. Uh, what the next question is, um, eating what I like and do much exercise, burning out calories. This is this proven method to control weight. Eating what I like and doing much exercise, burning out calories, is proven method to control weight. Controlling, yes. Eating versus doing exercise is maintaining weight and not uh, losing the weight, if you can, if you agree with me. Okay. Uh, okay, this question for you, Ms. Afra. Is the adiponectin hormone secreted from a certain gland in the body or from adipose tissue? From the adipose tissue. Okay, uh, Okay. one more question. Uh, what do you mean by saying intervention to boost metabolism? Yes, I mean there is different uh, way we can boost the metabolism by, uh, by increase the drink of the water, uh, by decrease the temperature in the, our environment, like use the cryo, cryo treatment or aquapuncture treatment or regular exercise with increase the density of the exercise all this is uh, it can help us and boost uh, the metabolism okay 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 the next question um thank you Ali, for valuable information can you share with us healthy diet plan for high cholesterol diabetes hypertension patients I'm a physician working in NCD clinic without a dietitian, unfortunately. Can you recommend an accessible, interesting application for the patient to assess their diet and create a healthy diet? Um, a platform for the patient themselves to access and uh, uh, assess their own diet is not easy. Um, it's easier to work with a dietitian. If you can refer them to any uh, dietary uh, institute, it'd be much better. Or more or less, they can follow the ADA guidelines, at least, uh, for following a healthier, uh, uh, healthy uh, diet uh, for specific for diabetes, hypertension. There are specific uh, general guidelines that can be followed. Otherwise, um, you can just send them to a facility that can tailor the uh, diet for them. Next question, uh, when can we decide that diet is not effective anymore for weight loss in obese patients? When you get when your weight, it, it becomes plateau. It's not change in your weight. So we have to be uh, turned to the next step of that. And we have different way. We have different way as approach, comprehensive approach. Okay, what is the weight loss recommended for children in a month? Again, we cannot answer that because Natasha is not here. And again, it depends on uh, children's age. Most importantly, it depends on the age of the child. Okay, do you think that a certain vegetarian diet may be the reference and a model to apply in high level of obesity populations? 
Not necessarily. It depends on the type of the population. If the population uh, follows the Mediterranean lifestyle, then it is uh, possible for them to apply it as a model, taking into consideration they don't have any underlying medical diseases. However, in that case, they have to follow a um, restrictive uh, diet and not just a regular Mediterranean uh, uh, dietary plan as a reference. So we cannot follow that. Okay. Uh, is eating some types of food every day willing to increase weight, like eggs, chicken, rice, with ignorance of the quantity? Uh, more or less, yes. It would increase weight, but depending on how are you planning to increase it. Like for example, if it was total dry, of calories, how much is taking? Exactly, depending on how much. Uh, what do you, um, what are your comments, Safra, on the use of fiber supplements in obese patients? Fiber supplement? In obese patients. What is the benefit? Uh, what are your thoughts? You just mentioned what are the uses of fiber supplements in obese patients? We are not recommending the supplement, the fiber. He can take the dietary supplement. It is natural, better than any kind of... Uh, formula or artificial fibers. So better to take from the natural source. Okay, uh, how do we control children or kids falling in love on chocolates and candy? <laughs> That's a very hard question. Children love chocolates. Uh, the only thing we can say is um, uh, try to not to keep it uh, handy for the kids to have it at any time and uh, as a treat between now and then is better than preventing them from having it at all time, which could have a negative drawback on the long term. Okay, um, if the child is five years old and has obesity, can we make a diet for him or care that he doesn't gain more weight? Uh, not making a specific diet for the child, but uh, at least um, make the child follow a healthier pattern, focus on um, uh, exercise and uh, moving a lot since he's only a kid, a five-year-old, active children, a uh, better lifestyle instead of uh, sitting on the watching TV, uh, PlayStation, etc., etc. Make the child interact more on physical activity and following a healthier pattern, of, uh, pa dietary pattern, not following a restrictive diet because that really doesn't work with children. Okay, uh, next question will be, uh, what do you think about intermittent fasting diet? I'm not expert pro with this diet. Uh, this type of diet, um, from what I have seen, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it depends on uh, the period that the patient can follow. And again, if the uh, patient suffers from uh, underlying uh, diseases. Otherwise, it shows, it ha there has been research that shows that it's beneficial. Uh, in improving, uh, for example, the di diabetes and uh, more or less weight. Okay, uh, can you please inform us about the required nutritional supplementation after bari bariatric surgery and the duration? Nutritional supplementations after bariatric surgery and the duration. Uh, what are your thoughts? He, he asked if it is important or not. Yes. What are the required supplementations? Yeah, it is important for him because in this period, it's, it is critical period uh, after post-surgery. So we need uh, to increase his uh, uh, and reach his requirement from the protein. Otherwise, uh, the patient, he will be uh, facing more complication in his health. So we need as much as can with poor appetite or small quantity he can take it. We need as much as can reach the protein requirement as well also the calories. For that we give him uh, the, the protein supplement and the calories we can control with the calories uh, uh, through the orally, uh, orally uh, feeding but the protein we cannot control in this period, critical period. So for that we give him the, the protein uh, supplement in this period. Okay, uh, and the duration is for how long? As per Depends. the question? 
until he tolerate the regular diet because we started with him clear, then full fluid, then soft. Later on, when he tolerate the regular diet, that's mean he can meet his requirement 100%. Per Unless he will start to do the exercise, we are evaluate his the intensive of exercise. Upon of this, we will prescribe for him if he needed uh, supplement and the protein or not, and how much quantity he needs. Depend the exercise. What if I'm not eating much, and although I am getting weight increase, I am not clear about the question. But I think he means he's not eating much, but at the same time he's gaining weight. Uh, what do you what do you say about that? There is different factors to play on this. Is. Maybe it, it, she has dep depression or uh, hormonal disorder or something. So she has to visit the doctor, do it the, the blood test. Then we can decide that where is, is the problem with him. And also we assess his intake. So we have to be assess all of this, the blood result, diagnosis, and the uh, intake then we can decide it for him. Uh, how about the adiponectin level? Is it generally low or influenced by diet and environment? Is it influenced by diet or the environment? I think that's the question. Environment. I'll repeat the means... question. Influenced by diet? Yeah. Uh, uh, How about the adiponectin level? Is it generally low or influenced by diet or environment? Both. It's influenced by diet because some of diet, it is uh, raised the adipoctin in the body. And the regarding the, the environment, what's mean if, the, if that patient is inactive, uh, eat too much and all of this, that's mean he will gain weight and it will affect on adipoctin uh, level in his body. So both, whether the diet should be healthy, food habits, and also he have to be manage his weight. So both. How to break the weight plateau? Uh, same as what we said, it is comprehensive approach. I cannot tell one only the diet or exercise because some sometimes the exercise it's not working with our patient. The diet, it's not working. So we need that comprehensive approach with him. Okay, since the adiponectin hormone is secreted from adipose tissue, why the obese people have no amount of this hormone even though they have lots of adipose tissue? I don't know. It is the studies. The studies show us like this. Once the, your uh, body weight is increased, that means the adipose tissue, uh, I mean adipoctin hormone, it will be low. This is what the studies show us. Okay, um, this question is about intermittent fasting. We answered that. Next question would be, how important is weight management, especially to pediatrics? Uh, Again, we can say it is very important to maintain weight at a younger age to prevent uh, developing uh, chronic diseases or uh, in future and maintaining healthier lifestyle throughout the lifespan, as you have mentioned. So it's very important to maintain weight from a younger age, especially in our current period of time. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, for the obese people who feel too hungry after activity, should you reduce the duration of exercise? Who is what? Again, please. For obese people who feel too hungry after activities, should mm -hmm. we reduce the duration of exercise? No, he should be increased, not reduced, but he have to be modified his diet by increase the fiber, fluid, all of this. Because the fatigue, it come maybe from the intensive exercise or uh, he didn't give him, uh, he didn't give himself uh, that break, a proper break through the exercise. So he have to be back for the coach to, uh, to arrange for him the duration and uh, intensive or exercise. But uh, as well, he have to be back to the dietitian 
to adjust her diet. Are there any nutritional supplementations that help lose weight? Yeah, we can, but it is under uh, dietitian uh, description. We can okay. skip one of the meals and the replacement the supplement for him, but this is we use for the patient who cannot or uh, for the lazy patient or he cannot um, calculate it properly how much he needed with the like with the dinner, uh, with the snack, so we can arrange for him like this. So it, it is work with him, but under uh, dietitian uh, prescription and under dietitian uh, um, instruction. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is again pediatrics. A uh, bad relationship between parents and kids could affect their weight. Yes or no? Most probably because. Uh, it, it's, it's psychological after all. And uh, psychological factors do affect weight, one way or the other, whether weight increase or weight loss and the type of dieting. Okay, next question. What, is, what are the important tests when anybody starts diet plan? What's the important tests when anybody starts diet plan? Oh, okay, I think um, they mean uh, what type of uh, blood tests that a patient can do before they start at any diet? No, no, it is, as co uh, it is as comprehensive. Once you will visit the doctor, he will, uh, he will check off uh, your lipid profile, liver uh, function, renal function, and also uh, hematocrit, all of this. So as general, we have to be check all this is indicator for him. But if there is something specific regarding the, the in, uh, endocrine problem, uh, also he will detect it once uh, the doctor do the exam for him. And they will give us the feedback. Uh, what are your thoughts about Sextenda? Sextenda? Yes. Uh, I will run away about this. <laughs> no benefit. It's designing for what? Let them to ask me. Uh, the, the endocrine doctor, they know more than me. It is designing for what that uh, uh, pharmacology treatment. It is designing for the diabetes patient. Exactly. So everything I have to use for the weight management, I cannot enjoy with my life like this. Not everything. It is easy. I told you it is comprehensive approach for manage, but uh, pharmacology, it should be specified for weight management not drug for other uh, other um, medical condition. Yeah, because um, they most are taking Sexenda thinking that this is the sole uh, treatment for weight loss. And it is work, not. and it is work with them. Exactly. Unfortunately, once <laughs> they will stop, they will gain weight. They're it is work with them. Exactly. But it is temporary solution, not permanent for them. We need something for long life, not temporary solution. And all these are fast, uh, fast results only. Mm, it is okay. fast results. Okay, uh, can we give Atkin diet for the children? No, as you mentioned, children are not to be given any restrictive diet. They should follow a healthy dietary pattern. Nothing restrictive for children. Yeah, and also the keto, uh, ketogenic diet is designed for epilepsy. So the doctor, he's decided if that patient have epilepsy child, they can start it with him, but there is multidisciplinary team work on this. It is harmful if they are used like uh, mass. Yeah, so they have to be careful with that. Okay. Some people say that when they are angry, they eat more. Is that right? Yes, yes. This is hormonal. It's hormonal. So you have to be careful. For that, I mentioned in one of answer, you have to be manage your depression. Because the epinephrine, uh, epinephrine hormone uh, reflect on that. So you have to be careful. Okay. Can we use herbal supplements like Himalaya products to reduce appetite and lose weight? Herbal I supplements. I don't have any idea uh, about this. 
regardless, uh, such herbal supplements, um, they're not effective like you mentioned on the long run. They are just something that shows might show benefits, but in a short period of time and from person to person, and it's not effective. It might be harmful for some patients because not all herbal supplements are safe to use. And actually the dietitian uh, not uh, specialized with the herbs. We are specialized with the food. So we have uh, scientific evidence with the food, not herbs. Okay, uh, calculating the kilo calories per day depend of on as for the physical activity and work will depend on to control obesity important or not i have to rephrase this question again calculating kilo calories per day depend on as per the physical activity and the work will depend on to control obesity is it important or not okay so i guess the question is to calculate the caloric intake and the physical activity to control obesity is this important or not together? So most probably yes, the answer is yes. It's very important to control physical intake, physical activity and uh, caloric intake per day to control obesity. Uh, lower caloric intake, higher physical activity will result in better weight loss and control. Okay, uh, do you know something about leptin and adiponectin index as a predictor of metabolic syndrome in children? With children, no. I don't have studies with children, all for adults, not children. Because actually the body mass index is used for the adult, not children. They have another, uh, another scale to wait uh, to measure the, the obesity with the child. With children, yes, different yeah. charts. Okay. Uh, people with hypothyroidism who take proper medicine therapy, they suffer from not losing weight, even though they follow a restricted diet. What can we advise? Hypothyroid patients. Uh, they have a problem with losing weight. What are, the, what are your advices on that? What are your thoughts? Can I repeat the question again? Hypothyroid patients who take medication, uh, thyroxine most probably, they suffer from not losing weight, even though they follow a specific restricted diet. What are your advices on that? No, maybe it is a fluid retention with the uh, high blood pressure. So we have to be no exactly, and it's need deep investigation with the sure, doctor. Sure, sure. Because that is being seen with most of uh, hypothyroidism patients. Okay. Are there any strategies for weight management for older patients aged 55 to 65? Any specific weight management strategies? For We can't, we can't uh, subgroup these as geriatric patients, most probably. Um, in, my, in my opinion, there is no, no specific. We have to check underlying medical conditions if uh, this patient or this older adult is suffering from any uh, problems, underlying problems such as um, uh, diabetes, hypertension, has any issues, and then that's the only way we can manage. And then again, we move on to physical activity, uh, healthier dietary strategies, and mainly that, that's that's exactly what we look for with older adults. Okay. How effective are diet and exercise mobile applications in helping with weight management? Anything you can believe it, it can control your mind. That's mean you will lose your weight. You can control your weight. If you believe about the, this is program and you arrange yourself to monitoring your uh, intensive exercise, time, everything, that means you can follow, follow this program. That means you can control your body weight. True, true. Okay. Do you believe that a adiponectin hormone may be an option for prevention as well as management of type 2 diabetes? Maybe in the future. Why not? It's now a clinical practice. Not uh, only clinical practice, but it can in the future. 
Uh, is there any relationship between night sleep and losing weight? Sure, because one of the disturbance, it is uh, sleep apnea. So there is a uh, study show us once you are reduced five to 10 percent uh, uh, from your body weight, that means it will reflect on sleep apnea. It will enhance. So it is good indicator. Uh, how many or how less hours of sleep affect kids' weight? Any mechanism? I think it's more or less the same question regarding the sleep, whether it's adults or children. More or less the same. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Again, we have questions about the sextenda going on. <laughs> okay, so we answered that. Uh, I think we have most probably answered most of the questions if we have any more questions yes there is one more question there are there any evidence that the fat body starts to break after half an hour from exercising so that people who exercise for less than 20 minutes because uh, they can do more time regarding the causes oh, okay so i guess uh, if i rephrase the question is it uh, true that fat body fat start to break after 30 minutes of exercising? What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about that? Is it true that body fat starts to break 30 minutes from exercising? After 30 minutes, the, the body starts to lose weight? No, it is depend your fit. If you are fit, we started a minimum 30. But day by day, we have to be increase the, the intensive and uh, time of uh, time consumed during the exercise. So 30, it is not enough for us just to warm, warm with 30 minutes. And also depends on the type of activity, mm. type of physical activity that is done. Different. Yeah. Okay. Um, bench disorder, bulimia nervosa. That is... Uh, Another another topic. That's a huge topic. That uh, uh, bulimia, uh, nervosa. You yeah. said it is nervosa. So it is something <laughs> uncontrolled. It's very difficult to to control that kind. Anorexia nervosa and pul uh, bulimia nervosa. It's very difficult to treat this is kind of uh, health condition. Uh, but we can. We can, but it is a need uh, a lot of patient to treat uh, that patient. And they, uh, for the bulimia, they have big, big, huge uh, body weight. So we need to apply the comprehensive uh, approach for weight management on this because they have a huge weight. Uh, how is the dietary guidelines different for children than adults? Yes. Yes, we have their diet, dietary guidelines are different for adults and different for children. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Is dietary sugar useful in your opinion? Dietary, dietary you mean artificial sugar? I'm not recommended. You can enjoy with the uh, natural sugar and just you have to be know the amount of how much it gives you the, the calories. So no need to go the save your money and save your health because you don't know the side effect for anything artificial. It's better to take the natural, but uh, you have to know each cube, how much it's amount of glucose inside this one. That's all. You can, instead of that, to take the honey or uh, that beet, uh, beetroot uh, sugar. Uh, there is a lot of... Uh, 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 natural sugar, not only this is for the corn. Uh, uh, sweet corn, not only for the sweet corn. There is beetroot, there is uh, sugar. sugar. There is a lot of natural sugar. You can use it, just you have to be aware how much it is contained sugar. And it's healthy, no side effect. Okay. Since you mentioned bulimia, now we have another question about anorexia nervosa. 
انوركسيا الله يخليكم خلونا بعيدا <تصفيق> هاي الحاله واحده ستاند باي عليها سو ات از ديفيكالت تو هاندلينج ذيس كيس بات وي كان مانج اوف ذيم ات از اولسو ات از نيد مالتي ديسيبلينري تيم بيكوز ات از سمثينج سايكولوجيكال سو وي نيد تو مالتي ديسيبلينري تيم تو ورك اون ذيس How is pediatric weight loss different than adults in regards to advice? Uh, again? How is pediatric weight loss different than adults in regards to advice? Which uh, I didn't understand. Uh, uh, for example, um, how would you advise pediatric children in weight loss? How is it different than advising adults in going to weight loss? Because the, because the, uh, um, the, 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 the um, the pediatric we not advise them with the restricted diet it is the different point the main point but for the adult i can restrict with them the diet physical activity both it should be increased but the diet we should not restrict with the child okay can obese yes okay can obesity be genetic yes yes Uh, people with cortisone treatment can't lose weight. How can we help them? If not lose weight? Those who are using the cortisone treatments. No, they can. They can, uh, they can control the weight, but uh, they have to be back to the dietitian to assess the intake and medication, lab result, all of it. They can do it. Close monitoring with these patients. Mm. <laughs> Is protein diet risky and for how long can it be on? We cannot say protein as general. We cannot say like this. Even if high diet, what does it mean high diet? What does it mean uh, protein diet? No, we should be no high protein diet. That means there is limited for that. And the dietitian only she can calculate it, what she means high calories. And she can calculate it how much that body needs upon his different criteria, like height, weight, or physical activity, and all of this. She can decide, decide it how much the body that needed from the protein, whether the formula, whether the powder or liquid, or from the dietary food, she can decide it how much he needs. If the dietary, uh, dietary uh, food, it is not... Uh, meet his requirement from the protein, the dietitian, she can decide it from the powder of the liquid how much he needed to add on uh, his uh, dietary food. Can lipid diet help treat obesity? Lipid? Exactly. Well, I, I'm not sure what do they mean by lipid diet. Controlling maybe lipid diet, if controlling lipid is controlling fat. And if we're controlling fat, then yes, we can help treat obesity. Yeah. Where it is. So reflect each other. Yes. Is it true that low caloric diets, like 1,000 calories, increases weight more than moderate? No, uh, I think so. She's um, she mean regarding the metabolic because if you are play with your metabolic. That uh, yeah, metabolic uh, metabolism. You are play with the, your metabolism. That means it will yeah, it will be so effect on your like weight. Weight. You sure. cannot uh, manage your weight because the metabolism it will be low. So for that you cannot. That means you're safe. It is more than how much your uh, uh, intake, uh, caloric intakes. Yes. Why does cortisone increase weight? This is mechanism of uh, of that uh, uh, drug. I don't know, but doctor, he can, they can yeah, any answer of this. This is mechanism. I don't know how it is work exactly, but one of them it is gain weight. But if the patient re, uh, go back to the dietitian, they can control the weight. Is it right that to stop eating after seven? has a good weight reflect? Maybe, maybe. If you stop to, the, to eat for a whole day, you will <laughs> reduce your weight. Even, <laughs> even. 
but you have to be select the healthy way, healthy way for you. Maybe that patient, maybe that patient or person, he is pre-diabetes, so he will not tolerate to fasting long time. We have to be careful. So we will give them like fruit, one fruit, uh, uh, the end of the day or something, at least to give him little bit sugar for whole night. This is the same pattern that goes with intermittent fasting when you stop eating after a period of time. It's the same concept. I'm not expert. I'm not expert. Almost with the same concept. Okay. Cortisol is a hormone increasing in Cushing syndrome. So I think uh, this uh, doctor has answered for us the question, Dr. Abdelazak. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. It's a hormone that increases in Cushing syndrome. Okay. Uh, you have just mentioned that a very low caloric diet can be followed for about 12 to 16 weeks. Is it logical? More or less, yes, it is logical because after that, like we mentioned, it will affect the metabolism and then we will have uh, uh, no weight change, as we can say, or it might have even a, uh, an opposite reaction, like we can say. So don't play with your body metabolism. Exactly. If uh, if my drug causes weight gain, any solution? Again, if you're taking any medication that causes weight gain, the only solution is trying to control your dietary intake, increase physical activity, and then that's the only solution that you can have to maintain your weight or prevent it from increasing, more or less. Okay, if obesity is uh, heritage, uh, I'm. Uh, if obesity is hereditary, how can we manage it? If obesity runs in the family, how can you control? Everything we can control, everything. Right we from the start. Right yeah. The start. You have to be start with the right way. If that means a dietitian, start with the dietitian, then you can know everything and control your body weight. Okay, um, Dr. Abdurazak is commenting also again that clinical nutritionists will play a very important role in such a disease. I think he is mentioning Cushing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank doctor. you very much, Dr. Abdurazak, for helping us answering most of the uh, medical questions. Okay. Um, I think we have reached the end of the questions. Let me just wait a few seconds if we have any more questions. Yes. Uh, again, Dr. Abdurazak, drug-relevant obesity, mostly seen in Cushing syndrome due to the corticosteroid drug. Yes. Again, that's that's one of the causes. Some of the periodic surgery, after post-periodic surgery, we're facing this is a problem with the Cushing syndrome, and the patient, his weight is resisting to lose because the patient has the Cushing syndrome. So we have to be follow him. We have to be very close with that patient. Okay. Uh... Oh, Dr. Abdurazak, I am also a practicing in clinical nutrition. We should have, uh, we should bring him on sometime then with us. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdurazak. Thank you, Dr. Okay, uh, okay. I think we have reached the end of our questions. That was a very interesting talk, Ms. Afra. I'm sure you agree. Tonight we have a very interesting topics, very interesting questions so far, very interactive uh, participants, i um, happy to say. And um, is there anything you would like to add before we wrap everything up? I'd like to say anything. <laughs> Thank you for all our attendees and listening to us. Mashkoreen, mashkoreen ala al-hadur wa tafa'al ma'ana wa shukran Dr. Abdul Razzaq. حضورك والكومنتس اللي عطيتنا إياها أنتوا بروحكم مدرسة يعني الدكاترة بروحهم مدرسة وإحنا فريق معاكم إن شاء الله باللي فائدة المريض. Thank you very much again on my behalf again and uh, all of uh, Emirates Clinical Nutrition Society I would like to thank everyone. Uh, just a reminder before we go off. Uh, um, the CMEs will be available in 10 days from now, filling out the evaluation form that will be sent all of you to your email addresses. 
And uh, this webinar will be available on demand on the APCCN website and on the YouTube channel of the MCI. Once again, I would like to remind you of our uh, APCCN 2020 uh, conference, which will be next week from the 17th to the 20th. Uh, you can look it up on the website, register. Uh, it's going to be interesting four day talk with uh, interesting speakers and talks. We will be going through most of the titles that we have talked about recently. And we hope to see you all uh, next week. And thank you very much uh, for staying with us. Like I said, it was a very enjoyable webinar tonight we had. And I hope to see you all next week. Enjoy yourself and have a great night. Good night, everyone.